The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Okay, um, welcome everybody to Designing Interactive Systems 1. This is the first class of semester in uh, this lecture series. Um, and today we're going to be covering a few topics. We're going to give an introduction to the class, talk about the administrative details, how it works. Um, and then we'll jump right in. We will um, talk about some basics of human psychology that are super useful to understand um, to build better user interfaces and in general to understand how people interact uh, with technology. My name is Jan Borchers. Um, I'm the uh, professor teaching this class and um, we are of the Media Computing Group. I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, our group in a minute so that you understand what it is about. For now, um, two things that you should take away from this. The first is, this is um, in terms of the topics that we're covering, a fairly unusual class for a computer science curriculum. Uh, we'll turn you all, we'll do two things. We'll turn you all into people who are consistently unhappy with user interfaces from now on. You'll always be able to complain about why a UI is bad, but you'll be able to complain about it in much more expert terms. So you will be able to use the right words when you're saying why a UI is bad. Um, and you'll never be walking you know, through doors or using hotel faucets again without wondering why on earth the designer made them this way and not some other way. But this will all be also useful to teach yourself how to create a great user experience for any kind of technology that people might be encountering, from user interfaces on apps and websites all the way to simple things like a, like a door handle or a water faucet. The other thing to take away from this is, as usual, the jump page for this class. Um, the URL is at the bottom of this page. Please make a note of that. That's the most important URL to remember, because from there you will be able to get to everything. Videos, uh, the Moodle rooms, um, up-to-date information will be posted there, and it's freely available. You don't need to be logged into anything to get to that page. So it's a very useful uh, starting page to use. All right, this is a class that will basically teach you how people interact with technology. And it's stuff that actually is useful for the rest of your career. Unlike most of the technical content that you learn in computer science classes, which gets old pretty quickly, you know, in a matter of maybe five to 10 years, um, we will tell you stuff about how humans work. And, you know, since our brains don't get updated as quickly as, you know, Windows does, uh, this material, this knowledge will actually stay with you pretty much forever. Um, talking about the uh, video conferencing session, you are doing this class this year online because we want to keep everybody self, safe and healthy. And we also have a lot of students who haven't been able to come to Aachen yet. And we have um, a record attendance uh, sign up for this class. So I'm really happy to see so many people interested in this topic. Um, we would still like to have an interactive class if possible. So while you don't have to, as you know, um, we would request that you turn on your video if you don't mind. It'll create a more interactive um, environment for everybody, for us as teachers, but also for you as students to be able to see your fellow students, to start getting used to faces that you might end up in, in you know, exercise groups with together. Um, and be um, assured that your video will not be in the recording that we do of this class. We won't, you won't, your face won't show there. Um, if you ask a question, and we do encourage you to ask questions, then your voice will be in the recording. And that's pretty much um, all that is uh, left in the recording of your identity. So don't be concerned about your privacy. Um, if you do want to ask a question, please go ahead and use the uh, raise hand function. So we just don't talk uh, over each other. That's a little inconvenient in online uh, settings. And um, if you don't have a question, um, it's a really good idea to mute yourself. As you probably know by now, you've been through lots of online trainings and, and classes. Uh, and we may mute you if you happen to forget about it. Um, so don't take that as an offense. It's just so to avoid echoes. <coughs> Zoom has a nice feature where you can set it up in the audio settings so that you can press space um, like you know a, a push to talk button. So you hold down space while you're talking um, to temporarily unmute. And that's a pretty neat feature um, that you can look at to, in, in your audio settings. Also, good idea to turn on some lights in your room uh, so you don't look like a zombie to the rest of the class. Okay, uh, with that out of the way, um, the other thing I wanna make sure 
first of all, it's a good idea to check your Zoom client every now and then and make sure it's up to date because otherwise some of the things like giving feedback won't work as expected. We'll also be using breakout rooms um, quite intensively. So um, for that, it's a good idea to have your client up to date. If you think it's not up to date, if your update um, check shows you that your uh, client is old, you can you know, just update it right now, disconnect for a second and then come back in, we'll let you back into the class. Um, the other thing is, as you probably saw, you would have to download a few files from our uh, jump page from the website. Um, and you know, doing that will help you to participate in the experiments that we will be running uh, in just a few minutes. Because that's another part of the interactivity of this class. We try to do things that get you engaged and that you get you experience some of the psychological rules in particular um, by experiencing, you know, doing the, these exercises yourself. Okay. Um, so uh, just a brief word about uh, me, where, where I'm coming from. I studied computer science myself at Culture University of Technology and, and Imperial College in London. Um, started focusing on human computer interaction during my studies uh, and then uh, did a PhD in, in computer science uh, at Darmstadt and then also had some stayovers and, and universities of Linz and Ulm um, and started really to look at interaction with multimedia. This was the big thing back then, right? You know, you know wow, we can have CD-ROMs and, and video and, and, and stuff like this. Um, I pioneered the idea of HCI design patterns, of, of using the concept of design patterns in human computer interaction and that has actually caught on very nicely these days. Um, you know, 20 years later, you can buy books that contain guidance on designing interfaces that are actually formulated in this pattern format. And that was part of, you know, that was basically my PhD thesis that, that brought the concept of design patterns into the realm of human computer interaction. Uh, I then moved on to be an assistant professor at the University of uh, Stanford in Silicon Valley in California in the US um, and stayed there for a good two years. Um, and taught about interactive rooms, did research on ubiquitous computing, user interfaces, um, and then had a very brief stop over at uh, the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Well, and since 2003, I, I am a full, full professor at RBTH. Um, um, that was uh, pretty early in my career. I was very lucky to score a, a full professorship um, at a comparably young age. So that meant I could actually focus on longer term research goals. And uh, since then, we have, uh, as a group, worked on interaction with audio and video, but also wearables, tangible user interfaces, and a, you know, for the last 10 years, also a strong focus on personal fabrication and hardware-oriented user interfaces and usability, um, improving uh, developer IDEs. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of different things that we've been covering over the years. Um, so I will show you in, in just a few minutes, I'll show you a couple of demos of, of work that we've done just to give you a feel for what HCI as a research discipline can take you to. Because if you take this class, um, you may find yourself following up on our um, you know, advanced classes in HCI. And then before you know it, you might be writing your thesis or doing a heavy job at our lab. Uh, and so I will give you a taste of, of what's to come. All the PhD students that we have, I think pretty much everybody there actually you know, came through originally through the DIS-1 class and, and getting to know us as a lab um, through that lecture. But I'm not doing this by myself. In fact, I would be completely unable to teach this class by myself if it wasn't for my two trusty and, and busy and super awesome research assistants, Marcel and Oli, right there. Uh, they're logged on here today as well. And uh, here's their pictures in case you can't find them among the many, many different you know, small video uh, miniatures that you're looking at. Um, and, and we do have a request. You, you're going to have questions about the class, about assignments, about making groups, and, and so on and so on. The first place to go to is Moodle, uh, the Moodle forum. The reason for that is if you have a question, it's not unlikely that others will have that question too. And we will answer it on Moodle. And so that way, everybody gets to see the question and the answer. And uh, that makes it possible for Marcel and Oli to really manage the incoming amount of questions. If 100 people ask them the same questions and they need to answer individually, they're just going to get drowned in email. So anything you don't have that is not highly personal in nature, um, please ask it via the Moodle forum. Um, and I'll get to your question in a second, Frederick. Um, and if you do have a personal issue, then uh, email Oli or Marcel. Um, with the, the prefix DIS1 and square brackets in the subject that will help you 
them filter their onslaught of email into things that are relevant uh, about DS1 and get back to you quickly. Um, as a recommendation, I get a lot of email from a lot of other places too. So if you email me about something that you could ask Marcella or Oli about, you're probably just going to increase answering times significantly. So um, please contact them. Don't send stuff to my email address. Um, you know, they are going to be monitoring everything and they're going to have a quick turnaround on, on your requests. All right, Frederick, you had a question. Please go ahead. Uh, it, it actually resolved itself by the chat. Lovely. Okay, no problem. Um, so uh, we're going to use the Moodle forum. Um, that's going to be our um, main uh, means of communication here. Now, uh, I said this class is about human computer interaction. So what is that about? Well, human computer interaction is about user interfaces, uh, like this really bad one, OK? Um, it's about user interfaces, about good interfaces, and about bad user interfaces like this one. And we're going to hopefully teach you how not to build these kinds of bad UIs, but how to build awesome UIs that your users will delight in using and, and enjoy uh, working with. Finding this was actually done by just Googling for bad user interface and sort of picking um, the, the number one hit. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's the Google ranking you want to be famous for in, in your life. Um, so this UI is obviously not well designed, right? It's, it's way too crowded. It's not structured well. There's way too much stuff on the screen that doesn't explain itself. Uh, it, it's gonna, you know, it has bad color coding. So we might say, well, uh, okay, so it's a, it's a confusing user interface, but what's the big deal, right? Well, the big deal is that if you give people bad user interfaces, you're gonna end up with unhappy users, right? I talked about this briefly in our two minute trailer for this class, and that is really what you need to avoid, right? What you need to get around. Um, there's a lot of cost associated with, you know, getting users to be less than happy with your UI. Um, first of all, they're going to take longer to do their work. Right? That may pay out uh, in, in more money that they need to get paid because they get less work done per, per workday. Um, they will make more mistakes. Again, that's going to you know, reduce the quality of their work uh, that they're creating for themselves and for others. But less tangible, but maybe even more dramatic is if you give people an interface that they don't feel competent using and that they don't feel, you know, supports them in their work, they're not going to be happy with it. And they're not going to be happy with their job and their task as a result. And you don't want unhappy employees, obviously, in your, in your company. All of these things increase what we know as the total cost of ownership, right? So if you mindlessly throw an SAP standard solution at a team that, you know, in a, in a business, uh, without looking at whether it actually helps them get their job done better and more efficiently, you might significantly increase the cost of production, the cost of work in the, at that company. Um, so you need to make sure that that doesn't happen. And finally, if we think more about the consumer market, you know, unhappy users will not create the kind of emotional you know, tie-in you want. You want loyal users who enjoy you losing your app and who are looking forward to you know, getting the next version, maybe even paying for an upgrade or you know, signing up for a subscription these days. And all of these things mean that it won't happen if people feel that, yeah, your stuff gets the job done, but it's really awkward and, and takes a lot of time to work with. So we want to avoid interfaces that you know kind of look like this for the most part, right? This is from a from a nuclear power plant. And um, you know, there's a lot of to be said about you know, some interfaces need to be highly complex because the task is highly complex. But a lot of interfaces are unnecessarily complex and they could be simplified, they could be structured better to make them easier to work on the task uh, that you have to do with them. And there are examples, and you'll read about those in a, in a book that we'll use as a textbook, um, where workers in a nuclear power plant looked at their uh, switches and they were like, you know, a series of light, uh, a series of switches, and the one was like turn off the light in the control room, turn off the light in the entry hall, and and you know, initiate nuclear meltdown or something, right? So, and those buttons all looked the same, and they actually went to the trouble of gluing things on top of these buttons, little figurines or tops from like you know uh, uh, faucets, so that they, they would just stand out and be different, so that they wouldn't press 
you know, the wrong button inadvertently because there is a high cost in this case associated with making that mistake. Um, this picture should also you know, illustrate to you user interfaces. We think about user interfaces mostly as graphical user interfaces, right, on our smartphones, tablets, laptops. But user interfaces don't just exist on purely software-driven screens, right? User interfaces don't have to be on a screen. Uh, they don't have to be graphical. They could be text-based on a screen, but they can also be in hardware, right? A series of switches on you know, your nightstand's uh, alarm clock or something like that um, is also a user interface. Even as I said, a door handle is a user interface. So learning the principles uh, here that we teach in this class will help you actually to improve interfaces on all these kinds of levels. So hopefully that'll help make the world a little bit of a better place. Uh, and I'll show you an example of a very simple UI, a very simple system um, that actually had a significant usability issue. Um, this was on a report where there was an emergency exit door. And in the US, emergency exit doors usually have these wide bars that you push against, and then they will unlock. And it's usually you know, armed with an alarm so that the alarm goes off so you can't just leave you know, through that you know, door to, to steal something, for example, from a shop. Um, here, we have something slightly different. You need to push that door, door handle, for like 15 seconds. Um, as, first, you need to push it until the alarm sounds, and then the door can be open 15 seconds later. And imagine this when there's a fire. Somebody reported, you know, we ran towards the exit and five other people were in front of us and they were pushing on that door trying to get it open and it wouldn't. The emergency exit would not open. That is truly disastrous design, right? So something as simple as a, an exit door, a fire exit, um, can be messed up in, in terms of usability. So we don't want to do this, right? So expect this class to be a little bit of a brainwashing, right? You won't be looking at doors in the same way anymore. Uh, you will recognize bad user interfaces, hopefully also good ones. Um, and you will hopefully learn how to make great user interfaces yourself. Now, to give you just another angle on this, why this is important, we said, you know, we want to have a, a happy users and, and make sure they don't uh, work unnecessarily hard or long or inefficiently. Uh, we said it can be a, a significant, you know, safety issue even. Um, but it also sells, right? Um, here's an, a little example from the history of technology. Um, in 96, the DVD player was introduced. Sony introduced it. And in its first year, it did something that had been unprecedented to that time. It sold 350,000 units in its first year. Um, no entertainment device had sold as many units before upon introduction. And this is pretty great, right? Now, 2007, the iPhone got introduced. It sold a million units uh, in its first quarter alone in 2007. Now, this may not be a fair comparison because, you know, the moment you buy a DVD player, there are no DVDs in your house, right? So you don't really, you can't really do anything with it unless you start buying DVDs. So the ecosystem, you could say, around the DVD player wasn't really there. When the iPhone came out, the ecosystem, meaning the mobile telephone network, the data network, even though it was slow at the time, uh, was sort of there. So it was easier to sell this device. Um, but that's actually not really the biggest point I want to make. The point I want to make is we all know that the, you know, the iPhone did things significantly different from any other phones before. There was no smartphone before the iPhone came out. Um, and removing the keyboard and, and giving people all touchscreen and being able to adjust the user interface to the task at hand. This was all um, very influential. But um, so people picked up these, in, in these iPhones and found how useful they were and how well easy they were to use. And Apple kind of got back in the market with the iPhone, really. And then something interesting happened. In 2010, Apple introduced the iPad. Um, and that device sold 3 million units in the first 80 days, not even the first quarter of 2010. And what's surprising about this is if you asked anybody who picked up an iPad back then, what are you going to do with it? They were like, I don't know, but, you know, I really want one. Right? So people bought this even without having you know, a killer app in mind that would mean that they needed this, this tablet. 
So clearly what was happening there was no, okay, Apple has a great marketing machine, right? So they're really good at selling this stuff. And, but also people had built up an image of the iPhone and rightly so as being a highly usable device, very well designed user interface, very smooth, very consistent, very logical, easy to pick up and use, gets the stuff done, doesn't make you look stupid. And you know, not making somebody look stupid is a great thing in a technical device. And people had gotten used to that, word got around. So by the time the iPad came out, um, people who had an iPhone said, well, this is just gonna be, it's gonna be just as great. And now I can look at a bigger screen and I don't know, maybe read my newspaper, but whatever it is, I know it's gonna be easy to use. So that's another reason why you want usable products because this can build brand loyalty and, and, and product loyalty uh, that I think is, is well-earned, right? If you make a great user experience, People should be um, excited about your product and, and pick it up. All right, so that's why usability and good user interfaces are important. And the field of HCI, of human computer interaction, is trying to find the theoretical foundations of how you create good user interfaces. So what is human computer interaction or HCI in short? Uh, what is that about? Well, first of all, this picture, by the way, is taken from a, uh, a curriculum uh, about human-computer interaction that goes way back to 1992, uh, but it's, it hasn't really changed um, in, in today's manners because it's such a fundamental uh, principle. It was designed, by the way, by the ACM, the Association for, the Computing, for Computing Machinery, biggest uh, professional body of computer scientists in the world, an international um, group. Um, and uh, it has a special interest group on people who are working in HCI. Um, and that group you know, gave this definition back in 92. It's called ACM SIGCHI, that group. Um, so first of all, obviously HCI is about the human, right? Human information processing. How do people process the information they get through their eyes, their ears, the senses in general? Um, and what happens when we look at stuff? What happens in our brains? And we're going to be talking about that in this class. And then secondly, it's about language communication and interaction. How do we make ourselves known? How do we communicate with others? What are our expectations when we interact with another person? Because we mostly interact with other people, right? And technology can learn a thing or two from these patterns of interactions. For example, how long should it try to take until somebody answers when I ask them a question, there are certain expectations we have hardwired in our brains, and it's a good idea to learn from those expectations and build software accordingly. Then there is an area uh, that we will be, you know, this, this part uh, about the human will actually be the first part we cover in, in DIS1. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the computer is a topic, of course, and um, on the top, you see that the context of use is a big topic. And at the bottom, we see that the development process, how do you arrive at a good user interface as a developer, as a designer, that is the fourth big area of HCI. And this fourth big area, we will also touch on quite he heavily in this class. In fact, the whole second part of this class is gonna be about that. We are gonna first look at some example systems and case studies from highly successful and groundbreaking user interfaces to see how HCI evolved over time, what kind of lessons were learned, and how it might evolve in the future. And then, and this is gonna be the third, maybe the most fun part of this class, um, we are actually gonna be doing prototyping and building prototype user interfaces ourselves. And this won't mean coding, you know, you can probably, you know, for DIS1, you probably won't be needing any coding environment or hardly any coding environment on your laptop. Most of the stuff we'll do in this class will not be about writing code. It will be about this crucial process that needs to happen before you start writing code, where you're not figuring out how to write the program, but what program to write. What is the actual problem your software needs to solve? And that is something that your code editor can tell you. This is something where you need to get involved with users, figure out what they're doing today, observe them, talk to them, interview them, build prototypes, on something as simple as a piece of paper um, and show that to users and get the feedback of how that works. So these evaluation techniques, we will also be talking about um, because they are covered in DIS1 as well. 
And this will involve paper prototyping, um, you know, think aloud studies, contextual inquiry, all these kinds of uh, study techniques and, and evaluation techniques and prototyping techniques uh, that you should know. So these are the areas we will be covering in DIS-1. Um, in fact, we do have a class DIS-2 that's coming up in summer, which will talk more about the right-hand side here of this arena, um, you know, talking about dialogue techniques and dialogue architecture and input and output devices. So if you find what you're learning here today uh, in this class interesting, then we encourage you to consider taking DIS-2 in the summer, which will be a lot of coding. You will be doing all the coding that you might be missing this semester. That'll all be happening next semester. We will be going through a fast-paced series of learning how to build interfaces, how to write Hello World, like you know, simple programs with a lot of different IDEs, you know, um, Java, Mac OS, Windows, um, and a whole bunch of others. Um, Savas, you've got a question. Go ahead. Uh, is this course for a master or for a bachelor? Um, we actually have a slide on this, I think, coming up. Uh, but uh, you can take this class as a bachelor elective, or you can take this class as a master's. Thank you. Sure. All right. So to talk a little bit more, as you can see, we're not talking much about using context. There are classes that are offered, for example, by uh, Wolfgang Prinz at uh, uh, Fraunhofer uh, that we have collaborate with that talk about the area of computer supported collaborative work, CSCW. Uh, and they go even more into those kinds of things. You also have a human technology uh, uh, center um, that is at the um, um, at the university here, and they consider things like, you know, social impact of technology uh, in a larger area. Uh, and finally, of course, you know, uh, my uh, colleague and friend, Life Cobble, teaches a great class about computer graphics, uh, which we're not going to go into much detail about. We're going to cover a few basics of how computers draw stuff on screen, but we'll leave all the, um, you know, nitty gritty details of how that's happening and, and, and you know, 3D rendering pipelines and so on. Um, to life's class. That's a very mathematically driven class, um, but uh, you will learn a lot. All right, first cat picture in the class. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, right on. Okay, so this class in a little more detail, what are the topics we will be covering? I said we have basically three sections, right? First section will be about the human. Um, so we'll be talking about these things as uh, performance of uh, what can people, how fast can people react, how much can they remember, etc. We will give you some models of interaction, like how can we think about what's happening in your head as you interact with technology. Now we're not going to get biochemis, you know, biochemically correct in terms of you know how neurons fire, etc. We're going to use engineering models. Engineering model means it's a model that is not necessarily describing the true nature of the thing it's modeling, but it's good enough as an approximation so I can work with it and derive some numbers from it that turn out to be correct in experiments. So we'll give you some models of interaction of how people interact with technology that will be super useful for you to think about user interfaces and understand why people make mistakes sometimes and why they get along great with other kinds of UIs. And from that, we'll derive some first kinds of design principles. Then we'll move to a fairly short segment in the second part of the class where we look at the history of HCI, some visions of how the past thought the future would turn out. These are sometimes highly in, um, instructive, sometimes they're highly hilarious, um, and uh, we will learn how technology matures and what happens to the user interface as technologies enter the market and get uh, adopted in products. And finally, and this is you know the, this big practical uh, part of this class, uh, the development process, right? the prototyping and design process. This is essentially where you will learn the key skills that uh, are nowadays uh, summarized under the term design thinking. When I was at, at Stanford, um, we were already teaching these kinds of things, but we hadn't come up with the term design thinking yet. That just ha uh, happened, I think, a few years later. Um, but you know, this empathizing with the user, understanding what they need, finding out what they actually, uh, what the interface needs to do, testing it with them and iterating about it. This is all what you might call design thinking today. So that will be covered in this third and largest part, uh, I would say, of this class. If you need to see more details, again, go to our jump page. And if you scroll down or use this hash, you know, uh, the, this anchor here, 
um, then you can find the syllabus for the class. You can unfold it and see everything that's going to be happening over the course of the semester. We got some textbooks. The left one, if you want to take this class, go out, buy it today as an ebook or a paper book and start reading if you haven't already. Uh, this is a required read and we will be going through this quickly. So don't dawdle for four weeks and then say, ah, I might pick up that book because by that time we're gonna be done with, that, with the topics in that book. It's not a difficult read, um, but it is extremely important that you understand what's going on. And the first couple of topics we cover to a large degree, especially these models of interaction are covered in this book. And it's also written uh, by a guy who's one of the most influential people in, in, in human computer interaction. He's been around uh, since the late 80s. He's been working in HCI. And this book is essentially the Bible of human computer interaction. Right? I, I think we can say that um, with confidence. If you ask any researcher or even practitioner in HCI, they will very likely know this book and probably have read it. Um, so this is the book that will make you an HCI um, um, you know, a professional, and that will get you started on your path to understand what human computer interaction is about. And it's hilarious because it'll show you lots of practical examples of devices, and it has lots of little stories in there, like the one with the with the buttons in the in the nuclear power plant, uh, that will really you know relate these concepts to you, and I think in a very easy to understand manner. So not very mathematical, although written by a psychologist, but um, um, it does have these fundamental principles of human computer interaction that we care about uh, in there very nicely. And the other one is a recommended read. We will be uh, providing short excerpts from this for some of the chapters um, in a, in be behind uh, our uh, sort of university wall um, if you don't want to pick up the whole book. But I think this is the best single volume textbook on HCI as a discipline, right? Whereas the next, the left book, the required read, explains some fundamental rules and 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 laws that you need to understand and gets you into the mindset of HCI. Um, the right one is the one that you would need if you wanted to, you know, really get cracking at doing your own HCI work as a practitioner or as, as a researcher. So a great book, um, but we will provide some chapters on it. You don't need to necessarily pick it up in its entirely. If, if you're afraid. I still highly recommend it though. Okay, just a few words about, first of all, our teaching offerings, right? What else is waiting for you? I already mentioned um, DIS2, uh, but let me take you through what's, what, what we have as, as human computer interaction curriculum for you in, in, in store. There are two things that are open only for bachelor students. Um, the Multimodal Media Madness uh, lab uh, m3 that's happening uh, in the summer semester um, and a human computer interaction seminar also typically um, a pro seminar also typically in the summer semester um, so these are only open to bachelors and they are the earliest contact points that we have typically with with students in the bachelor program but you know don't fret if you didn't take those that's not a problem there's nothing in there that you must know before you enter our classes the real base class the anchor class for everything we do is dis1 that you're attending right now so you're in the right place um so if you take this class here today uh then all the other things will start making sense to you so in the summer we've got designing interactive systems too as i said that class takes on the technical side of HCI and goes back into actually prototyping user interfaces and software and understanding what makes a user interface tick. How on earth is a mouse click I do on, on my device on the, on the table, how does that turn into an event and get channeled into the right application and window? How do window managers work? How do mobile application, uh, um, you know, window systems work? Um, what about, you know, going even beyond graphical user interfaces? What about tangible UIs? Um, haptics, um, audio input, you know, all these gesture interfaces, all these things we, we talk about in DIS2. So it's a much more technical class. Um, the other class we have is iOS application development. Um, now, this is a class that's also taking place in winter. It's happening in parallel to this class. So the opening lecture there was yesterday. And I think I recognize some faces here uh, that also attended uh, yesterday. Hi, Tarek, <laughs> picking you out here because you happen to be on my screen right now. Um, 
So uh, that's a class teaching you uh, developing for um, iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch, uh, those kinds of devices, and also gets you a great exposure at mobile development in general. Um, you can attend this class this semester in parallel, and I encourage you to do it for sure. Uh, but that class has limited seating. And if you didn't attend yesterday's opening lecture and haven't done the necessary um, you know, signups and, and, and things, I think today, is that right? Today, Tarek, at, at noon, is, at one o'clock is the deadline, right? So after our class, if you're really fast and if you didn't attend the first lecture, you might still have a chance to applying for that class and getting into the lottery. But we only have 84 seats for that class because it's highly interactive as a seminar part to it. Uh, and we already had ooh, over 200 applications. So I'm sorry to say that we won't be able to take everybody. That's different with this class, as you uh, probably heard. Uh, this class was limited to 120 students the, these past few years. Um, and this year we got record application numbers. Uh, we're at what, like 280 registrations now, I think. Ollie, is that right? Nearly 300. Up to 300 now. Okay, so a lot of people are signing up for this class. I hope it's because you enjoy HCI and not just because we're teaching it online, unlike lots of our colleagues. Um, so uh, I'll ask you if you, you know, we opened up for everybody and we changed the class a little and you'll see a few changes from, from what we used to do in the class to accommodate this large number of people. Please bear with us as we try to make this happen because we really think everybody should have a chance to take this class. I think knowing this kind of stuff is so important for you know, becoming a good developer, becoming a good software engineer, becoming a good, good computer scientist really, um, that I don't want to you know, send anybody away. And we can do this this semester because we're online. If I'd had to find a room for 300 people you know, within 24 hours, I don't think that would have happened. So um, welcome everybody, glad you're here. If you decide not to take the class, please deregister so that we get a good gauge on, on, on who's in. All right, so the other class we have is current topics in HCI. That's a research class. This is where we talk about the latest and greatest research happening around the world in human computer interaction. We go to the top conferences in the world each year. We submit our own papers there and we often get them published there. Um, and so we have a good idea of what is really going on in HCI in the research field. It's a pretty big one. I think it's the biggest um, conference at, at, at ACM after SIGGRAPH, the, the computer graphics conference. Um, so it's a big field in HCI, um, um, in, in computer science even, and uh, we'll talk about what the current research is. It also gives you a great chance to see all of our PhD students talk about their field of, of expertise and their particular topics and, and projects they're working on, um, because they give guest lectures in this current topics class. So that gives you a great way to pick and choose who you want to maybe do your thesis with. And, and that, is a, that is a master's class, I should say, though. Um, and uh, then we've got post-desktop user interfaces, a seminar that we do that is, an, um, that is uh, typically uh, aimed at graduate students and the master's programs, um, and the Media Computing Project, also a, a practical lab where for a whole half year you get to sit down and in a small team work intensively on a really interesting uh, interactive project that you get to shape yourself to a large degree. For example, I think in um, uh, you, you're running this um, uh, this semester, right? Um, with uh, it, it's happening again, Oli. No, sorry, sorry, that's Renee, right? That's running it. Yeah. So Renee is running that uh, this semester, uh, and uh, people are writing Fusion plugins for uh, Fusion 360 to do awesome 3D modeling um, extensions. Um, as you know, labs and seminars need to sign up um, the the semester before, at the end of the semester before. So. Uh, keep that in mind as we near the end of the semester and look for in your inbox for any calls to sign up for labs and, and seminars um, at the end of uh, the winter. All right, a uh, couple examples from our, uh, from our lab. This is AR Pen. Um, and uh, what AR Pen does, it's an iPhone app you can download on the App Store actually today. Um, and you need to just print a little um, QR code on a piece of paper. You don't need this fancy pen if you don't need, want to build it. Uh, and it lets you doodle in 3D in front of you. So you can create 3D sketches in midair with this. This came out of a research project we did about um, you know, designing in 3D um, with the help of a, of a simple smartphone. Um, and I encourage you to try it out if you happen to have an iPhone around. Uh, another example, Springlets. 
Uh, this was a work that was published um, at CHI at the, at the top conference in HCI uh, that we have internationally. Um, and springlets are a toolkit um, to create haptic input on the skin. Um, they use uh, shape memory alloys that are special metals that actually contract when uh, electricity is applied. Um, and uh, we use this with some ingenious 3D printed mechanical add-ons uh, to create a whole variety of um, haptic input on the skin from you know, a, a soft pinch to a, a stroking feeling to a tapping feeling and so on and so on. Um, I'm always giving you the jump page for these projects. We, we use a hopefully very user-friendly scheme. You go to our homepage, you enter our homepage URL, HCI, blah, 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 slash, and then the name of the project or the name of the thing. So slash DIS1 takes you to, or DIS takes you to the class, slash springlets takes you to the springlets uh, um, project. Here's a little video showing that actuator actually moving and contracting when you apply, apply current. I also put um, the links in the chat. Ah, oh, lovely. Click. Thank you. That's a good idea because you know people can't can't really click them on the <laughs> in Zoom. That's all right. Sure. Um, another one, Headbang, um, uh, a project uh, that looked at how can we use the new capabilities of smartphones to track the user's face and eyes and head orientation to create um, to create user input. And here you can see um, this system actually uses uh, the user's head uh, movements to help them. Uh, type on this keyboard down there. I'm going to roll the video here real quick. So you see Oli is basically typing here by just picking one of the three letter boxes and then moving his head in the direction in that three by three letter box to pick a, a letter. Or here we're using it to select something from a circular menu. Um, another example, and now we're getting to stuff that people like you did, this is actually from M3, the undergraduate um, uh, uh, practical lab. Um, I love steampunk. Um, and so one year I just said, guys, I also love escape rooms. And so one year I just said, guys, please build a steampunk inspired escape room puzzler. Build a box that you know people need to work with, solve a, solve a riddle in a limited amount of time. And if they manage to do it, they get a you know, code that will let them pass, you know, move on in a, in a possible escape room uh, scenario. So uh, here is an example, uh, the safe that uh, these students designed as a result. And that safe actually needs to be used by two people. Um, I'm going to play that. It's about 20 seconds. And you can see how it works. So you had two people on each side and uh, you have seen the keyboard with the blinking lights there and uh, one should communicate which buttons to, to click for the person on the other side. And also another riddle you had there was that you had to, uh, to identify a, a certain tone, a certain pitch, uh, which only was viewable hu um, from the person you see on the top right here. And so the person on the left has to set uh, the correct uh, symbol depending on that pitch on the wheel you see on the left. Ah, lovely. Yeah, so it was, was <laughs> it required people to collaborate because you could only either hear the tones on the one side or actually um, set the dial on the other on the other side. Um, you can also see this is making great use of our fab lab. We've got a lab at the at the chair uh, that has all kinds of personal fabrication tools like laser cutters, 3D printers, um, uh, PCB mills where you can make um, printed circuit boards uh, and add, you know have them milled out of copper um, and uh, a variety of microcontrollers uh, and a whole electronics workbench, uh, soldering um, opportunities and all that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, some music just went off in my room. I'm gonna, just going to turn that off. <laughs> so welcome to the generation of smart homes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Talking about usability. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, another example that's actually from this summer uh, is a, an AR preview project. Uh, Oli, maybe you want to explain this. Uh, I can roll the video and you can talk about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, I can try. So um, this uh, in this uh, practical lab, uh, the students implemented plugins for Fusion 360, which is a 3D modeling software. And the idea is to 
test the models you have created within this software in reality using virtual reality. So you could place uh, your models on top of such a checkboard and then use and then uh, click some buttons in the interface and uh, this model is transferred to your AR app and you could print out this, this checkboard there with the different markers and place it at the location you wanted to place your models and check whether the uh, whether the models fit there well, whether the size is correct. And what you also could do is do small manipulations within the app. So if, for example, you want to have the ducks a bit larger or smaller, you can do the scaling in the app. And this is back transferred to the uh, 3D modeling software, so Fusion 360 in this case. Thank you. All right. And uh, beyond classes that we teach, we have, a, uh, we have two kinds of events that we uh, hold regularly. Um, that we also want to share with you is to give you an idea of what we do and what you can be part of. Uh, we have an Aachen Maker Meetup. I've been running that for over 10 years now. Uh, we meet every third Wednesday of, of the month. And it's, you know, the, the tagline is people doing strange things with electricity. If you're building weird stuff, if you're into um, you know, 3D printing, if you're into uh, hacking microcontrollers, if you're into LED strips and, and building your own uh, light up garments or something, um, or doing any of those other uh, things that are strange stuff with electricity, you're welcome to join us. We haven't been able to meet in person, obviously, due to Corona these last um, couple months, but we have an online meetup, um, and that next event is on October 20th. And you can go to um, and either just our jump page, HCI, blah, 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 slash AMM for Aachen Maker Meetup, or you can go directly to meetup.com um, to get to, to the sign-up page. And the other event that we also have um, every month is a, a Cocoa Heads meeting. This is a meeting of people who do Mac OS and iOS development. Uh, the picture below here is showing one of our students at the time on the day one after I, Apple released their iOS SDK so that you could develop software with, with iOS. And he was already giving a class you know, from zero to hero how to write your first iPhone app uh, back in, I think, 2009 or something. Um, that student, by the way, on the right here is now uh, a developer at Apple in Cupertino. Um, okay, so those are two events that, that I wanted to point out for you to, to check out. Now, um, finally, I want to share a couple administrative details, class structure. Um, first of all, uh, credits and grading. So uh, we teach in a group-oriented format, and we teach in a project-centered format. We think these are vital skills for you to pick up, and they're especially important when you do design work, because you always want to be able to bounce your design ideas off other people. Um, what we'll be doing in the semester is there will be uh, six assignments, uh, homework assignments. You'll have to pass six of uh, five of, or, of those six assignments um, as a pre uh, prerequisite to be uh, allowed into the exam. So uh, this is the, in, in German, the Zulassungsvoraussetzung for the, for the exam, the uh, precondition to be able to write the final exam, you need to pass five out of the, those six assignments. Um, now, passing the assignments uh, will mean that we will take a look at what you hand in, and we will decide whether you took a serious stab at this assignment we won't be grading it down to the last point. It's not going to be part of your final grade. Uh, this is different from past years. Um, but we will offer you the opportunity to make these, do these assignments, to learn the stuff that we uh, that we teach, uh, and to hand them in and to show us that you that you took a stab at them. Um, and if they're you know sufficiently there, uh, then we consider that you know, you 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 try to work with the stuff. Now you might still want to know you know, what the right solution is. And of course, we'll talk about the correct solutions in our lab sessions. Um, and that's also uh, the chance for you to ask any questions that you might have about your particular uh, exam. Um, Oli and um, uh, Marcel will be in charge of running these uh, assignments and lab sessions, and they'll be answering all your questions about this um, at the latest um, on Monday, I think, right, when we have our first lab session. Uh, the classes for six ECTS credits. Um, so uh, what we want to make sure is that you work throughout the semester, right? That's why we have these assignments in place that you are required to, to start working on. So we don't want you to push everything off up to the last, you know, 72 hours before the exam and then, you know, have this 20, 72 hour learning frenzy where you try to cram everything in your head because A, 
uh, you're going to not learn things as well there for the exam. And also you're going to forget them right afterwards, right? This is not how you learn as we know from you know, learning theory now. So you need to expose yourself to the material over the course of many weeks. And because I know you guys are all awesome and do this anyway, we want to you know, reward you for that. And that's why um, we will give you parts of your pro uh, points for the project you'll be working on at the, towards the end of the, pro uh, the class, part of it for the final exam, but part of it also for a midterm. And that midterm is an intermediate exam uh, that takes place um, around um, December, I think, is, is the time frame right now. Um, and that will give you a chance to already pocket some part of your grade, your final grade, early on in the semester. And it's another encouragement to stick with us and to stay on top of the material every week and not push it all off towards the end of the semester. So overall grade will then be calculated from that uh, weighted sum there of the grades you had for each of these uh, sub uh, uh, parts of the class. Uh, the exam date for the first uh, exam is, is given here, February 15th. Uh, and you need to do two things um, to pass the course. First of all, to be allowed to into the exam, you need to uh, pass five of the six homeworks um, and, and take a stab at those. And then to actually pass the class, you need to uh, of course, pass the final exam with a 4.0, but you also need an average grade of at least 4.0. That's trying to make sure that, you know, if you've collected enough points before the final exam, you don't just drop the final exam. All right. Um, I should also say at this point, um, usually when we're in, in presence uh, teaching, we ask people to participate in face-to-face uh, uh, -face user studies for our research projects. So that, that will give you a chance to get an exposure to how user studies are actually run. Um, and uh, we might do that as well this semester if we have anything that we need users uh, to be you know, to be parts and studies um, in an online format then, of course. All right, uh, next up, how do you sign up for this class? Um, as I said, we opened registration because there was an overwhelming demand and we didn't really, we really didn't want to turn anybody uh, away this semester. So, um, you need to have registered on RVH online or do this right now. Uh, and you need to send us the, de the declaration of compliance. Uh, this is important for us for several reasons. It explains that you understand uh, what the uh, consequences of um, you know, plagiarism are. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're all very clear and aware of that. Uh, we trust you not to cheat and not to plagiarize. And um, because we extend that trust, um, if we do find that somebody misuses that trust, we need to be pretty strict in the, in the consequences. Uh, the other reason why we need your DOC is because um, in it, uh, you tell us uh, whether you agree for us to use the video material that you'll be producing as part of your final project um, on our website to feature it, to tell others about the class and to show the awesome work that you did. So. Uh, send in those two things, you know, register on, on, uh, online and send the DOC to um, Ollie and Marcel today. Uh, and that will make sure that you are part of this class. Um, if you cannot register on RWH online, there's always cases of people who may be doing uh, Erasmus studies or sometimes um, the Master of Science in SSE or other uh, programs may not be able to sign up in RWH online. Um, drop Marcel and Ollie a note uh, with your matriculation number and your full name uh, from your official RBH Aachen email address, and then they will take care of you. Um, finally, we have a weird situation this, this semester because last year we taught this class online. This was a very sort of you know, last minute change and, and everybody was trying to work with, uh, with the COVID situation. And so there may be people who took the class last year and they could have just accepted the uh, passing grade that we gave last year because we didn't actually give numerical grades last year. Um, but who said, I want to write, you know, I want a numerical grade. And those people uh, should not register for this class, but instead, uh, again, drop an email to Ollie and Marcel um, and let them know uh, that you're one of these special cases. Okay. Uh, we know there's a few of you out there, so um, uh, please make sure to contact us. Yes. Any but, emails you send us, please add the DIS uh, tag at the front to help Marcel and Oli um, find those emails and handle them quickly. Uh, Marcel, you wanted to add something? 
Yeah, just just we 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 know the names of all these people, so uh, it's it's we will oh, we will find yeah. you. <laughs> we'll find you. Yeah. <laughs> but they should still contact you, I suppose, right? Uh, yes, they they can contact us, but uh, most of them have already contacted us, and uh, we will we will sort right. it out with them. It's just it's such a small number that we can deal with it. Alrighty, um, then uh, we uh, maybe we can do this a very quick rundown to see who's in the class here. Um, so I want to see, uh, can you raise your tiny little hand in the in the reactions um, panel um, if you are a bachelor student in computer science bachelor's computer science okay um we're seeing about 50 ish 60 oh that's going up all right um that's a good about 70 i would say wow that's it numbers keep going up nice all right so we got a lot of bachelor students here welcome everybody that's great um uh, you can remove your, your hand, uh, and then I want to check um, who is in uh, Master of Science of Computer Science, Master of Science Computer Science only. Okay, that looks like it's getting around 30-ish all the way, all total, 25 maybe. All right, uh, uh, you can remove those, and the next hand up would be... Uh, Software Systems Engineering, Master of Science, SSE. Okay. Again, that's about 10 people here, I see. Lovely, thank you. You can remove those. And then we've got Master of Science in Media Informatics, the program we teach in Bonn at the BIT. Yep, that should be a significant number of people because that class is required for you folks. So. Welcome everybody. Um, seeing 21 folks right now, All right? Lovely. Uh, you can remove those hands as well. Um, and uh, now uh, you should all check that your hands are down. Uh, Savas, I think yours is still up and Jan, I think yours is also still up. Um, and now we wanna see anybody else, any other programs, if you could raise your hand, please. Because there's always other folks in there, okay? Ben, Michelle, Ute, Nina, Martin, and, and so on. Uh, that's 13 people, uh, 14. Am I, I'm, I'm assuming there's probably folks in there. Um, well, 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 why don't you just tell us, uh, Ben, what's your, what's your major? Yeah, uh, Bachelor of Science, Technical Communication. Ah, TK, of course, I forgot. I wanted to ask TK anyway. Yeah, TK, so, exactly. Um, okay, so maybe everybody who's TK bachelors, I should ask you to raise your hand. Uh, technical communication. That's going to be about five to five people, I suppose. TK bachelors. Okay. Not that many. All right. Um, and then we have uh, probably people from um, data science, maybe. Data science, anybody? Master of science, data science? Nope. Um, anybody from the Master of Science in uh, computational social systems? CSS. Yep. Okay. There's a whole bunch. 10 I'm seeing right now. Awesome. Okay. Did I, anybody who I still didn't mention, because that's perfectly possible. Uh, I'm seeing Saba and Martin. What's your, what's your majors? I study mathematic. Ah, yeah, me okay. too. Me too. Okay. Two mathematics folks. Welcome. And uh, Nima? Mathematic. Applied mathematic. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Applied Mathematics, Masters in Applied Mathematics. Ah, okay, Applied Mathematics. All right, great, thanks. Uh, lovely, so that gives me an idea of who we have here. Welcome yeah. everybody again. Can I also say something? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. There is also me, I guess I'm the only one who is doing automation engineering. Automation engineering, okay, great. Yeah, I just didn't see your hand there, great. Um, right. So I'm going to move on uh, one more here, um, and that's going to be about registration. Um, <clears throat> you need to sign up for the exam. This is not the class. This is the exam, right? For the exam, you need to sign up by January 15th. Um, and if you do fail, uh, there will be a short period to register for the second one, right? So don't miss that because you won't be registered automatically. 
Um, back in the days, sometimes that used to be the case. This is not the case currently. Uh, you do have the option uh, to register for both um, exam dates individually. Um, you don't need to register for the first and then just cancel that to go to the second one. It's not necessary. Um, if you miss that deadline, you can't sign up for the exam, right? You know, writing emails about like, oh, I missed the deadline will not help because that's what deadlines mean, okay? If you miss that deadline, you won't be writing an exam this semester. So, um, and when we reopen for a second chance, that's only for those people who were registered for the exam, first exam and, and typically failed. Um, you, you may decide uh, to take the second exam. I tend to recommend to everybody to go for the first exam um, right after the end of class because then everything is still fresh in your head. And if you miss it and or fail by any chance, you still have a chance to catch up in the second chance. Um, but you know you do have the option to just basically go for the second one directly. I wouldn't recommend it, but it, it is an option. And uh, we're we're still working out the uh, the placements and the availability of seats uh, for everybody. But we should see how things work out after the first few um, labs, and we'll know how many of you guys are are sticking with us in the class. Okay, so on to the model human processor. We're going to talk about the human first, I said, right? And so we will now deal with the human, which is increasing, you know, extremely uncomfortable for computer scientists because it's this weird bag of water that is not, you know, designed according to a clear specification. It behaves sometimes unpredictably. Um, and, you know, this we need to work with because it doesn't help if, your understanding and your thinking of the system you are designing ends at you know the computer screen or the or the smartphone screen. You need to think about the system as a whole. And the system is the computer or whatever technology and the human in front of it, working with it, and maybe even other humans around that are also interacting with the computer and the person in front of the screen. So um, actual systems, interactive systems, are more than just the tech side. They are a person interacting with technology in the simplest uh, case. And no matter what you're doing later in computer science and programming and software development, it's pretty likely that at some point, somebody will have to interact with your system. Think about that. Um, so no matter what you do, you should know that a user interface will be part of what you're building. Um, and this is why we, we cover this. Um, now, the model human processor is, is um, part of a book written by uh, three guys, Cart, Moran, and, and Newell. And uh, they wrote a whole book, The Psychology of Human Computer Interaction. And it was the first time that actually they were able to explain what's happening in human computer interaction with hard facts from actual measured experiments, quantitative experiments, mostly from cognitive psychology, actually. Um, so they basically went through all these psychology papers and, and just stole stuff, right? They basically just found results and said, hey, look at this. This is actually relevant for HCI. Um, and as a result, they built this model human processor. Uh, that was the first time that as a result of having that model, we were actually able to predict, to estimate how a human would perform in front of a computer when certain things happened. Now, it's important to understand that this model is not describing how we actually work inside, right? It's not biologically correct, um, <clears throat> but it's good enough as an engineering model to describe, um, to give us useful estimates for what we need to find out, no matter how, how simplistic or stupid the model is, right? Um, so here's the model human processor, and you can see from the time this was done, you know, uh, computing, of course, was already in full swing. So this model of the human brain kind of treats the, the, the human brain as a computer with storages. And, you know, back in the Middle Ages, people thought that the human brain contained tiny little gears, right? It's oftentimes these models of how we think the human brain works are more reflective of what society is currently thinking is the latest and greatest tech uh, than, what, than what's actually going on. So... But as I said, you know, for all I care, you could say the brain contains chewing gum. I don't care as long as the model you give me and the numbers you give me work and uh, the, the numbers I calculate with the model for like reaction times or 
memory capacity of humans actually match the evidence that I get from actually measuring people's behavior. So the model human processor um, is built up of three processors. We can see a, a perceptual processor that's a little bubble at the bottom left, a cognitive processor that's come second, and the motor processor that comes last. Um, each of these processors has associated memory, which is uh, shown by these arrows. The perceptual processor stores things in the visual and auditory image store. Uh, the cognitive processor stores things in short-term and long-term memory. And the motor processor gets its commands basically from the output of the cognitive processor through working memory. Um, this model comes with numbers. And uh, these numbers are always given with a range. As you can see here, there's always a number and then there's a range from two. And that is trying to represent right in the model that of course people aren't all alike. You've got people who will react more quickly to a button pressed or light going on and people who will react more slowly. And it's not just between people, but it's also the time of day, whether they had a coffee, uh, whether they partied long last night. So all of these things will influence how actual numbers turn out. But that's why the model gives you an average and a typical range of things to expect. And um, the model back then talked about these as slow man, middle man, and fast man um, to kind of you know, reflect that there were three different uh, representatives of, of this range of, of performance levels. We're now going to, you know, this is the model we're going to go through and we're going to talk about these numbers and we're going to run some experiments with you guys to give you an idea of where these numbers are coming from. And to start that, we're going to jump right in into the first experiment. Now, usually you would do that with a person next to you. You don't really have a person next to you right now. And because of that, we're going to do it a little differently. I will read out uh, the text of, 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 you know, some random text. It doesn't matter what it is. And what you need to do is um, really observe my eyes. Look at my eyes closely. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen for a second here. Um, and that should put my face you know, right smack across your screen. Um, and now I'm going to um, open up this uh, little uh, text here. And, and I'm going to read that to you. And you can just watch what my eyes are doing, right? Um, the Eiffel Tower is an iron tower built in 1889 in Paris, France. It was named after its designer, Gustave Eiffel, and is the tallest building in Paris. It was originally supposed to be built in Barcelona, Spain. The entire building weighs about 10,000 tons. Okay, good. Uh, so, um, would anybody care to uh, Tell us what you noticed. Uh, you can raise your tiny little yellow hand and, and uh, we'll, we'll pick somebody. Yeah, Frederick, go ahead. Yeah, whenever you're, uh, you um, had or uh, went to the next line, you had a little break, like um, the, uh, your eyes shifted and then mm -hmm. it was like, uh, I don't know, 50 milliseconds until the next word. Okay, okay. Um, anything else somebody noticed? Yeah, Tariq, go ahead. Uh, the movement was jumpy. The movement was jumpy, exactly. Yep, that's not as easy to see. It's, it's easier to see if somebody's sitting right across from you. Uh, but that's actually um, an important um, observation. Leonard, something else? Yeah, I've seen you blink after every line, but not in between the lines. Huh, interesting. OK, didn't even notice that myself. Um, Thank you. Uh, that's actually the, the key thing here is the, uh, the jumpy movement. Our eyes are not moving continuously like a scanner. They're actually moving in what's called saccades. Uh, I will show you a video um, that reflects that um, right here. This was done with a Toby eye tracker. Uh, this is a commercial eye tracker that tracks the pupils movements very precisely and it determines where somebody's looking at the screen with with high precision as a result so uh, this is what the toby eye tracker records when you when you do something like that
See, so that basically reflects what you should have been been seeing too. Um, so I have moved in these weird uh, jumps, right? And this has a reason. Um, the isocades, uh, the length of an isocade is roughly 230 milliseconds. Um, it's, it, there are biological reasons why the eye can't just move you know, constantly like that. It needs to focus on a particular area and basically understand what's there because we can only see really with high resolution at the center of our eyes. So it needs to take that into its uh, foveal area uh, region and then look at what it's seeing, kind of store that like an image, like a camera would store an, an exposure and then move on to the next part. Um, this also explains our reading rates, right? Because if your eyes move at 230 milliseconds and there's a certain size below which you cannot read text anymore, right? So text needs to be a certain size. Uh, of course, it can be smaller if you move closer, but that doesn't change the relative size of it, the, the, the angle of things you can see at any time. Um, the number of characters you can actually see per saccade is roughly 13 characters. And that basically translates into a theoretical reading speed when you're reading a text that's printed on a page, for example, or on the screen uh, of 652 words per minute, uh, which is an interesting uh, fact if you think about it, that we can already see that uh, people reading things on, 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 like, you know, on a printed paper, for example, or on a screen uh, are limited to a certain maximum reading speed uh, right from the start. So eye movement down here in this model is given with 230 milliseconds, although it can differ between 70 and as much as 700 milliseconds. So as usual with humans, there's a lot of variation in this. And the 652 words is only for you know, the average, pers uh, average uh, person, really. And uh, you might already think, hmm, OK, so that's the maximum reading rate. Does anybody have an idea how you could increase the reading rate? Because there's a way to actually read faster than that. Um, yeah, there's one possibility. You can have the um, the words not move. You can have the words are at the same location all the time. Then your eyes don't have to move. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. I don't know who just spoke. I didn't see you there. Um, but but you're right. <laughs> um, uh, Janusz and Fredrik, you had your hands up. Uh, was that what you were thinking about too? Um, no, I was actually thinking. Um... If you uh, look at something like uh, uh, steganography, you can compress more, you can like represent more characters with less of them and, uh, ah, and okay. so have more um, effective characters uh, in the same okay. space. Okay, yeah. Uh, that, that still basically, if you think about those characters as symbols, basically we're not getting uh, above that. But the point with the with this uh, with this what's called RSVP rapid serial visual presentation uh, that is actually the the one of the key th tricks you can do you can make it so that the text appears always at the same point rapidly uh, one word after the other and then the eyes don't need to move and that way you can speed up the reading speed beyond the the limitations of what the saccades can do. Uh, what was your thought, uh, Frederick? Uh, yes, yeah, so. Uh... Actually, if we uh, are well have reached a certain efficacy in reading, we don't really read the letters by themselves or the the characters by themselves. We read the mm -hmm. whole words, and I imagine that's why mm -hmm. those uh, rapid presentations show you ho whole words and not characters because that would probably be a little slower. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, but it, this also um, uh, leads to some mistakes because it's. A, sort of heuristic if some letters are switched around uh, or a certain way uh, we still read the correct uh, correct word right right yep that's a, that's a good point um so as we can already see even with an exercise as simple as that it quickly gets to the question of okay what does it mean to read right do i just need to know what word this likely was or do i need to read completely random garbled letters right these are going to be uh, completely different tasks, right? All right, wonderful. Um, now, uh, as you can see here, something is happening in the perceptual processor taking these eye images, and that's not happening every 230 milliseconds or something like that. It's actually happening a little more often. And the perceptual processor is, you could think about that as sort of the, um, 
kind of like the, the film in the camera that is your eye. And the 100 milliseconds is the exposure time of your eye as a camera. What I mean by this is um, that you actually, uh, the, um, the perception happens not instantaneously, but happens over a certain exposure time. There's a great way to test that. If I were to show you a brief flash of light at a certain intensity here, as you can see in the first graph, um, and then I show you um, another flash that is half as intense, but twice as long, and all of that happens well within the 100 milliseconds, then you will actually think that both are the same, which is just like a camera would work, right? It wouldn't know whether all the photons that hit the, hit the film or the, the sensor in, in the digital camera came at one time or whether they arrived you know, over the course during the exposure, the camera wouldn't know. And just like that, your eye can't differentiate these things either if it happens within this magical window of 100 milliseconds. So you can say stuff happening at this moment is actually happening within 100 milliseconds of right now, for your eyes at least. Um, and as you can see at the bottom picture, we can do an even stranger experiment. I can actually flash a light twice, like an LED that turns on extremely fast and, it, and turns off extremely fast. And I can do that within 100 milliseconds as well. And then these two flashes of half intensity um, that you know basically combine in your eye will also seem the same. So you actually cannot tell that a light flashed twice if it happens well within these 100 milliseconds. This is known as Bloch's law. Uh, Bloch's law basically says within this perception time, this is the the you could say the um, you know the the um, the cycle time of the perceptual processor within that time frame, um, the response that we are aware of, that we perceive, is actually the intensity during that time times the time segment at which that intensity was happening. So, uh, to put it in mathematical terms, we're simply integrating or under the curve everything in terms of light that comes in during those 100 milliseconds we are integrating up and putting into one bin um, and telling the, uh, the rest of our perceptual system, that's the brightness I saw at that point during, you know, at that moment, essentially. Okay, so this is important because what that means is if you have two things happening on the screen and they happen within 100 milliseconds of each other, well within 100 milliseconds of each other, then users should perceive them as happening essentially at the same time. And that is actually something that you can prove. Um, I'll show you a quick experiment here. This is the, uh, the next experiment we do. Um, and that in-class experiment is uh, showing two billiard balls colliding, right? You know, two stylized billiard balls. There will be one ball arriving, hitting the other ball, and then the other ball taking off. Now, I guess we all agree that if those were real billiard balls, there would be no, you know, the, the, the delay between the first one hitting the other one um, and the other one taking off is negligible, right? Uh, there might be a super short time of material compression, but it's going to be well, you know, probably in the microsecond range, if any. Um, so normally this should happen instantaneously, right? Um, and our video, uh, I'll show you three videos um, of these balls, one ball hitting the other and the other one taking off. Um, and I want you to pay attention to whether you think the other ball is taking off immediately as natural you know, steel or billiard balls would, or whether you think the second ball is actually kind of moving with some latency. Now, I'm going to do this via Zoom and we are piping, you know, uh, a video over Zoom and there's all kinds of shenanigans going on with frame rates and compression and so on. So this may not work as well as if you saw the video for yourself. That's why um, I think all you people can also download that video, right? This should be part of the download package. So you can play that video on your own computer. It'll still only be at a 30 frames per second. So we already have a 30 millisecond um, you know, random lag between frames. So that makes these things a little questionable, but uh, you should, you know, if the Zoom thing doesn't do it for you, you can try 
looking at the local video instead. So let me play the first video here. This is condition A. Now, uh, what we can do is, why don't you just raise your hand um, if you think, or you can now, I, I think probably raising your hand is probably wrong. Uh, maybe upvoting, downvoting is the better way to go. Uh, you can upvote if you think there, this happens immediately. If you think, no, there is a delay, there's a, there's, a, there's a delay between the one ball hitting the other one and the other one taking off, then you should downvote it. So in the, in the reactions, you should probably be able to, um, to do that. Okay, this is interesting. We're seeing about two thirds are saying there's a delay. One third is saying it's immediate. Um, okay, now I'm gonna play uh, video B, right? Condition B. Um, if you can remove your, your marks or reset them for video B, here's video B. Okay, again. Uh, vote immediate or delayed. Yeah, some people are still like, ah, I don't know, I'm not sure. Okay, this is looking pretty much like the same, the same as the last result here, two to one. Uh, and now we're going to play this third video. And again, I'd like you to vote green if you think that's an immediate takeoff and red if you think there is a delay between one ball hitting the other one and the other one taken off. Interesting. Now, I don't know how much of that is social peer pressure, but uh, we are seeing the numbers in that third case to clearly go towards uh, there is a delay, right? It's more like um, 70, 80 versus, versus uh, 20 to, to 30. Okay, but the results were not unanimous, and that's interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, now, what you just saw, at least, okay, let's say the video I tried to play here, uh, the videos had the following conditions. A had no delay, B had 50 milliseconds, and C had 100 milliseconds delay. But as I'm saying, this may actually get, you know, messed up, messed up through the video transfer. So looking at these on your own computer is probably going to be uh, more meaningful. Um, I do encourage you to do this again if you didn't get a chance now to try to play these videos on your own computer and look for the differences um, again. Uh, and in this 100 millisecond delay, you should certainly see that it almost seems the first ball is sticking to the second one before the second one takes off. But the 50 milliseconds, eh, not really something we, we clearly notice, right? Some people might say, oh, there might be something going on, but most people, um, you know, some, it's just, it's, it's kind of a, to a coin toss usually. Um, okay, so here's the results of this experiment, which was conducted um, by the, the, the CMN folks, Cart, Morin, and Newell, and they found the following. They found that if the time you can see it at the, on the x-axis, you can see the time before the second object started moving in milliseconds. And the y-axis shows the, the number of votes that each uh, case became. They had three. They said immediate causality, ball hits the other one and it takes off. Delayed causality, which means basically like this kind of sticky result, right? Ball hits the other one and then after a short delay, it takes off. And then independent event, like you know the, the first ball arriving doesn't really have seem to have anything to do with the second ball taken off. Uh, and as you can see here, up to about, eh, this is roughly around 50, 50 milliseconds here, or maybe 60 milliseconds, most people considered it immediate cause, to be immediate causality, almost 100%. But then it drops steeply, right? There's something going on in, at this point here where the vote for immediate causality really drops off between, uh, I would say, roughly 50 and, and, and maybe 80 milliseconds. And there roughly, uh, quickly, people start saying, no, this is, this is delayed causality, right? But there's still a, 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 a remnant of people who, who don't see that uh, delay. Um, but as we can see, beyond 100 milliseconds, there is hardly anybody left who says the causality was immediate. Most people by that point, two thirds, 
say it's delayed and people even start saying um it's you know it's actually uh it's it's independent events and if you move beyond the 100 millisecond range as you can see nobody goes over what is this this is maybe around 120 milliseconds here uh or 130 maybe nobody says that these things are still happening immediately so and by by the time you get to uh you know 160 milliseconds or something like that, then people don't even consider it a delay causality anymore. They clearly see these things as independent events because for everybody at that distance, they will end up basically on two different exposures of their internal retina camera. Again, as I said, it's an individual thing. It depends on your daily performance. If you had a long evening in, in Ponstrasse last night, your results would be different, you know? Uh, and also what will also influence this is the signal to noise ratio. That's why we're showing these things typically in white on black, because if I showed this to you in you know, light gray on slightly darker gray, you would actually have more trouble seeing the delay. So higher risk contrast means that the eye, the retina can respond faster, can record things better, which makes sense. If you think about from a like, you know, kind of like an engineering point of view, um, more signal to noise ratio, higher contrast, you can tell things apart more clearly. Um, now, you might say, well, how often am I going to show two things that need to be happening at the same time? I can just draw them basically at the same time. What's the big deal? Like computers should be fast enough. Well, this is tricky for a whole number of reasons. The first and the most important one is when you press a button in the real world and to turn on, um, you know, a light or something like that. The moment you press that button, let's let's say it's a you know it's an LED strip, right? These you know a modern LED strip or an LED light turns on immediately. It has no delay. Um, you know um, incandescent bulbs still take a little bit of a you know ramp up, but even they start burning basically immediately. So the real world has no delay, right? That's important to understand. If I if I take something and 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 hit a stick, my stick hits a a, a box. The moment the stick hits the box, I feel that, you know, that impact. I hear that impact as quickly as the sound can travel to my ears. I see it at the very moment that I, the stick hits the box, and I feel it in my hand, right? All these things are basically in sync because there's no delay in the natural world other than, you know, the, 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 the time that sound travels. But if we have technical systems, we often introduce delay. And... This may be as simple as, you know, your computer being too slow, although that today is no longer an excuse because computers that running at megahertz and even gigahertz CPU cycles in theory are easily fast enough to avoid delays on that range. But we've built abstractions on abstractions on abstractions. We've built systems where many system, uh, subsystems interact. We've got networking, we've got, you know, rem uh, um, distributed systems. And as soon as you introduce networking or any kind of communication between subsystems, you quickly introduce delay because protocols need to be negotiated and information needs to be passed on and processed. There's polling going on. Um, there are loops running in code that only pick up stuff every now and then. And we quickly get to the, these kinds of delays. And if you've ever used an interface um, on, you know, like for example, a, a, a website that lets you scroll through a big list, but it's slow, and every time you click, it takes like only a fraction of a second to catch up and to update. It feels terrible, right? You feel like you're walking on, 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 on slippery ground. It's really hard to operate these systems. Um, so the, the golden rule basically says that, um, you know, with this, with this perception time of 100 milliseconds, um, we need to basically show the results of the immediate results of an action of the user within 100 milliseconds to avoid uh, it immediately feeling like there is a delay. And as you can see, even if you say, well, I'm at 90 milliseconds, so I'm fine. Well, you're not really, right? These, this data from this experiment already shows that if you really want everybody to perceive it as immediate, you need to be more around like something of 50 milliseconds or less. That's still plenty of time if you're running a fast CPU, but systems can introduce lag uh, where you wouldn't expect it. I'll come, come to that in a second. Now, um, 
if you imagine you press a button on a on a on a smartphone and that button needs to invert right in order to show that you pressed it that's the same as a real button sinking in because you pressed it the real button sinks in the moment you touch it the physical the the, the virtual button needs to react with its inversion at least at least within 100 milliseconds better to do it within below 50 milliseconds to really feel fast this is one of the reasons why um, you need um, fast animation rates, right? If you think about how how um, movie theaters work, they run movie movies run typically at you know twenty five frames a second, twenty four frames a second. That was chosen because of the same reasons, right? P you know, people who tried this out noticed that at ten frames a second, the average person will start feeling that things are merging together. But for fast perceivers, um, that's not enough, right? And so that's why there's this extra buffer in, in uh, frame rates for, for, for the movies at 24 frames a second when each image shown separately comes by so fast that on, in your retina, they actually get merged together to become a continuous stream. All right, so uh, that's why we have these frame rates uh, for animations and, and movie theaters. Um, and this also explains the uh, you know the this this 100 millisecond perception time explains why there is this limit to the delay before this causality begins to to break down and as I said it shortens when you look at stuff um, at higher contrast with with higher intensity um, and just to give you a little example uh, I just recently ran some experiments um, on a on a modern computer like you know a, a modern MacBook and I measured the actual latency between uh, you pressing a button or, or, or moving some kind of input device like a joystick or something around uh, connected via USB um, and the actual time when that change appears on the screen. And it turned out that it actually is well over 100 milliseconds. Um, and not only that, but it also varies by as much as 80 milliseconds. And that explains why sometimes even modern systems can feel kind of laggy and, and weird. And that delay is a combination of uh, USB, especially bad USB drivers, introducing quite a bit of delay uh, and, and random latency because they have a polling uh, um, mechanism. Um, and uh, HDMI, which is your you know, normal connection to the computer these days, uh, which due to its encryption and all the digital shenanigans it needs to do, actually also introduces a um, not so low delay. Just for kicks, I tried this on a computer from 1982, a cheap home computer connected to an old CRT um, cathode ray to monitor, like the big clunky ones. Um, and with the exact same setup, you know, but not using a USB device and not using an HDMI monitor, but instead using a direct connected peripheral and uh, an analog monitor. And guess what? The latency dropped down to anything between one and 17 milliseconds. So that is completely unnoticeable as you can see in this graph. Um, and that's why sometimes, you know, you notice that people say, huh, weird, this computer is, you know, a million times faster than it was 30 years ago, but something's not right. This is because while performance is there, the many subsystems that we tend to connect these days and the complex protocols we run often ignore latency, right? So latency is a super important thing, and it's not the same as performance. You can have extremely low latency, even on a very slow system. If it's built smartly and if the um, communication protocols are made so that they don't introduce extra lag. Right. Um, so we've talked about the perceptual processor now. Uh, we're going to move on to the cognitive processor. Uh, another experiment is coming up. Here, uh, we will ask you guys uh, to split up in groups and uh, what are we, what, what's the group size now? We wrote six, but we may actually change that now based on how many people we have lined up. We can do it with groups of four. Groups of four. Okay. So we're going to, uh, Oli is going to throw you into random breakout groups of four people. This should be happening automatically in just a second, right, Oli? Yeah. And, uh, the moment, uh, okay. Uh, so when you get there, um, we'll ask you to start, um, to, you know, Two of you folks, if you're grouped of four, um, will read out a random sequence of five digits from your sheet to the others. Um, and what you will be asked is, we will ask you, the other ones who aren't reading uh, to just count backwards um, 
you can mute your uh, microphone during that time so that not everybody is talking. Um, count backwards from 50. Uh, and then uh, we'll ask you to, uh, you know, like what some random question, like what did you have for dinner three days ago or something like that. Uh, just to take your mind off things for a sec. And then um, those who uh, were listening to the number sequence will write down the numbers that they still remember. Now, if you are in groups of four, what I would suggest you do is um, one person reads, three people are, re are listening, and then um, one person is basically the reader, and then the three people listen, and the three people then count backwards, and then the one person who read or was reading uh, asks each of these other people uh, a question or the same question, and they can all answer it. And then uh, the three people are asked to write down the numbers that they still remember from the random sequence of five digits. Okay. Um, so I don't think we'll take time for switching roles for this because that might take actually a, a little too long. Okay. So Oli, I am. Um, do you want to? Let's start. And, and once you're done with that, uh, we will probably just yank you back into the the main room, right, Oli? In in a few yes. minutes. Okay. Exactly. So so you can come back if you are done with that. But uh, in some minutes, we will just yeah kick you back into the main room. So yeah, have a lot of fun and uh, see you in some minutes. So what's going on here is um, you will probably see that. Um, your performance wasn't perfect, right? Can we see a quick show of hands? Um, if we're gonna do it this way, if you if you yourself, you yourself remembered five digits, you know, that should be only half of the people who did this experiment. If you remembered five digits completely, please raise your yellow hand. If you remembered the five digits completely, raise your yellow hand. That's about yeah, it's going up. Looking at about 40 people here. Okay. Now, if you remembered the nine digits completely, please raise your yellow hand. Otherwise, remove it. Nine digits. All right. We got still hands up from Hadi, Henrik, and Michelle. Is that correct? Ah, okay. I think it's only Henrik at this point. And uh, at least go away after a while, right? Yeah. So we made notes of those three names because we're going to see whether we can hire those guys as heavies because you have superhuman powers, obviously. Um, the point is, obviously, we don't have uh, endless memory for these kinds of things. Um, and let's let's test one more thing. And this is, this is tricky to test, but I'll, I'll try. Um, if anybody in the in the last exercise remembered more than four digits where you continuously heard numbers if you remembered more than four so five or six or so in the last number okay there's a few people that's pretty good that's pretty good uh, looking at about 15 folks there so far um most people end up you know actually even lower than that as we can see from the from the numbers here that you know that's only a small percentage of the participants so what we did here is first we gave you a very short number sequence and that is something that your short-term memory can usually hold on to quite well even if you get other stuff going through then we gave you a long number sequence with nine numbers which very few people can remember completely if you if your brain gets uh, to do other stuff unless you really memorize it or it happens to have a pattern that is easy to memorize, like repetitions of numbers. And then thirdly, when we constantly flood your, your brain with new information, that's the toughest test, right? You constantly have to store new numbers as old ones get washed out. And then you're asked to remember those ones that you just heard uh, from the running sequence. And that's where usually people do uh, the worst. So all of what we're seeing there has to do with our long-term memory, right? Our cognitive system, stores information in so-called chunks. Um, and what we tested with you was basically how long you can hold these chunks in memory. And what we use in, in biology to describe this, because it is a statistic process, right? It's not always the same. Even for the same person in the same condition, it's not always the same. It's like what you might know from chemistry uh, known as half-life, right? When this is not the game I'm talking about, this is half-life in the sense of, 
a particle falling apart after a certain duration. It's a statistical process, but there is a time, a half-life, after which there's a 50% chance that the information is still there or a 50% chance that it's gone by that time. And this half-life is uh, what the numbers you describe. Um, the half-life for holding one item in working memory is pretty long, 73 seconds with one chunk of information, like one number. Uh, whereas with three items, it goes down significantly. Three numbers, three digits, for example, it's only as low as seven seconds half-life. After that, it's typically gone. Also, um, the capacity of all working term per memory is very limited. There used to be a famous experiment in the 50s by Miller that determined that the human capacity for things in their short-term memory, where they're not allowed to learn something, I mean, if you learn like a vocabulary, then it's there basically forever because it ends up in long-term memory, but working memory, where you don't have chance to, to memorize things consciously, right? Um, like the stuff that we just did, there the capacity was determined in the 50s as seven chunks plus or minus two. And um, modern studies actually place these numbers even lower. They say that the capacity probably is actually closer to four plus or minus one chunk of information. A couple of things to note about this. First of all, what's a chunk? A chunk is one item of information that you need to remember uh, distinctly. For example, if I say butter to you, you don't remember the letters B-U-T-T-E-R. Uh, it's just one term, butter, because butter is a concept that you know that you have stored in long-term memory. So it's one item for you to kind of have a pointer to that concept in short-term memory. Whereas if I said to you RFXVQ, you would have, those are also, you know, um, just a bunch of letters, but you would have to remember each one individually because they don't form up to shape a single thing that you already know. Right? So a chunk is always one item that you have a concept of in memory that you can refer to. Um, and so it depends on what kind of items we talk about when we measure capacity. Secondly, um, don't feel bad if your capacity was lower than five, for example, in the first test. Um, you know, you may not just be in, a, in, in good condition today, um, and uh, you know, stuff varies statistically, it's perfectly normal. But we see this concept of chunking in place in good user interfaces all the time. For example, have you ever had to enter a credit card number and one interface let, you know, lets you chunk it and visually just, you know, places it into letters of four each? Super easy to do, right? You look at your card, you type in the four letters. You look at your card, you type in the four letters. If it doesn't do that, it's so much harder, right? Because you try to maybe remember more numbers and then it's harder to remember them in, in memory. So there's a reason why we do this chunking. Also, um, if you look at, you know, there used to be a, a, an account number and a, a bank number in, in the German uh, banking system. And these were usually nicely grouped into small chunks. And even if you didn't group them, they were still just one number with you know seven digits and maybe one with five to eight digits. So they were okay to hold on to. Now we've got the IBAN, the IBAN, the International Banking Number, which is super convenient because it has checksums, which is great from a usability point of view. But if you don't chunk it into small parts, it's really hard to remember, read back, and 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 parse, right? So that's why people often chunk these things also into groups of four. And then finally, I should say this, this capacity depends on the kind of encoding that you were talking about. We now were doing actually um, acoustic memory, right? I, you know, you were read something to you and you had to listen and your acoustic memory is actually a little better in its half-life um, because audio information is spread out over time anyway. If you weren't able to hold a sentence in the time of our typical sentence in, in short term memory, you couldn't listen to a conversation. Whereas your visual system actually has a shorter half-life, um, but it does have a higher processing rate and it can take in more information at a time. So um, in the system here, these things are simplified down to the uh, typical capacity that we have, this uh, you know, mu wm star, this end capacity for uh, seven chunks, um, and we have a typical um, half-life for one or three chunks here modeled in this in this system. The cognitive processor itself also has a, uh, has a cycle time, and we'll talk about that in just a second. 
The cognitive processor is the processor that takes stuff that has been stored in the uh, visual auditory section, for example, from, from the perceptual processor of working memory uh, and takes it and acts upon it. For example, if you are asked to press a button when the light turns on, then the perceptor processor would recognize the light being turned on, would, that would end up in your visual image store as a bright light, that's all, right? And the cognitive processor would look at that and say, okay, the image has just changed from dark to bright. There was something we're supposed to do. There's a rule, which is press a button. To execute that rule, it takes one cycle, basically. And then it tells the motor processor, which comes afterwards, to do something with that information, like pressing a button, which takes its own time. We'll get to that. What we need to realize is that while working memory has these severe constraints, long-term memory, at least in principle, um, has infinite capacity in half-life. It's kind of like the mass storage in your computer. You can extend it arbitrarily. And humans don't have any measurable limit to how much they can store in, in, in their long-term memory. We haven't been able to, to actually put a number on that. So it's modeled as infinite. Uh, you know, once you've rem some, remembered something truly, like you've learned a language or something like that, or uh, even your home phone number, right? Uh, as long as it gets occasionally gets uh, retrieved again, it will never go away. Um, the other thing that this model uses is a semantic model of how we store stuff in memory. For example, how do we remember a concept? What, what's the concept of an apple in our in our head? Well, according to this engineering model, and all, this also kind of matches with what people have been finding in modern in modern research. Um, we mostly store things as links to other things, as associations with other things. So an apple isn't really a thing in our memory. It's a network of, it's a fruit, it's linked to fruits, it's linked to the color green and red, it's linked to the concept of a fist size object, it's linked to the taste of sweet. So basically an apple is actually not really, in this model at least, it's not really a thing in your memory, it's just a network of things that run together at that point. Uh, that's also why, for example, these uh, stupid rules, in German we call them Eselsbrücken, work for remembering something, right? But if you have to remember a number and you put some stupid rule onto it that makes, it rem makes you remember it, you are creating artificial bridges, artificial associations with things that you already have in working memory, and thereby you anchor the thing that you weren't able to remember before through these associations, and that, that's how you remember it. Finally, uh, Long-term memory is very fast in, in terms of its read access. We can get to stuff quickly. If I ask you your phone number, you don't need to think about it for a long time. You know it. Um, but to learn something is slow, right? as we all know. Right? Learning takes a long time. Uh, and in fact, some research shows that um, if you need to remember random items, like le learning, for example, a, a random number sequence, you max out at about seven seconds per chunk uh, that you need to remember. In this case, it would be a digit. Each digit would, you know, learning it in, in a single pass, you need about seven seconds until you've actually committed something to working memory. All right. So the cognitive processor is kind of, you know, the thing working with our memory, it's kind of comparable to our CPU in a computer in, in this model. So we've talked about these two parts of the, of the uh, CMN model. The last part is the motor processor. And for that, I've got yet another experiment for you guys to do, which is a lot of fun. I want you to look at the two lines uh, that you have on your sheet of paper that you printed. And I want you to take a, uh, um, a pen, um, and a pencil will work fine, uh, something that will be able to draw quickly with. And when I say go, I will count down and say go, then I want you to draw strokes between those two lines for five seconds. Uh, it should look roughly like this, right? You want to draw lines between these uh, things for five seconds, right? Trying to reach both lines, but not overshoot crazy. Are you ready for this? Get out your pens, pencils. Ready, set, and go. Stop. Okay. Now, I want you to count the number of reversals. And you don't need to count them on both ends, because guess what? For everyone on the top, you've got one on the bottom. 
right? Pretty much. So just count them, for example, at the top end. Count the number of turnarounds that you're that you made in those five seconds. All right. Okay. So uh, we're not going to collect your numbers, uh, all of them, but you probably ended up with something in the rough order of maybe 30 to 40 reversals on one side, right? Um, here in this example, we got 34 reversals on one side. That's 68 reversals total. That means if you do the math, you can determine how many milliseconds per reversal you needed. Right. So in my case here, for example, I've got 68 pen reversals in five seconds. That means that I get to a time of 74 milliseconds per reversal. You can do the math for your own example if you if you would like, and you probably end up with something in the you know 50 to 100 milliseconds range as well. What that means is. Basically, you're dividing 5,000 through the number of reversals, right? And that will should give you the number in, in milliseconds if you want to do the math. Um, what that means is that you actually have just measured the cycle time of your uh, cognitive processor, right? Uh, sorry, sorry, your motor processor. So you've basically been showing how fast can your motor processor go back and forth? How often can it change direction? Because you did it as fast as you could, right? So we now know the cycle time of your motor processor, but now I want you to count something else. If you look at your, uh, your sketch, you will probably notice that you started out with a certain length of strokes and then they became shorter or longer. And at some point you notice that, oh, oh, I'm getting too short, I need to correct. So that reversed. Notice the line, you can draw this on your own uh, data, on your own sheet and try to draw a line that is kind of like the hull curve of these corrections. So it goes up and then it goes down again, and then it goes up again, and then it goes down again. Each time your, the length of your strokes reverse direction, right? These started becoming longer or they started becoming shorter again. It's not a perfect science, right? But um, you should be able to, be, to draw this kind of uh, hull curve, which shows how you corrected your data. Now we're gonna do something else. You're gonna count the number of corrections that you did on that line, on that red line. So basically now we count the number of turnarounds on that correction line. Just do that for a second. That should give you a number, a second number. That's should be lower than the first one. Um, in this case, in this example here, I've got 10 corrections, right? Marked with these yellow X's. And again, you need to double that number because 10 corrections per side means total corrections 20. Now, if I take my 5,000 milliseconds that I ran this study for, divide this by the 20 corrections, I end up with 250 milliseconds per correction right? And that is actually quite precisely the number of the perceptual processor cycle time plus the cognitive processor cycle time plus the motor processor cycle time. Because perceptual is 100 milliseconds. We already knew that. Cognitive is 70 in the model. And motor is another 70. That adds up to 240. Isn't that cool? And this is from actual data from a, from a sample of running this. And we end up pretty much in the ballpark of that number that the model was suggesting. Why? Because the 70 milliseconds is how fast your motor processor is able to correct. So that should be the, uh, shown by the number of reversals you did. And the whole cycle is necessary when you notice in by looking at your sketching as you draw, that your lines are becoming too short, your perceptual processor sees that, your cognitive processor says, uh-oh, too short, please extend the length of lines, and then tells the motor processor to correct that. And that's the correction that need your whole round trip through your system um, before it can have an effect. So what that means is we've measured the open loop motor processor um, roughly 
uh, 70 milliseconds roughly um, uh, of that processing cycle time. So every 70 milliseconds, our motor process can do something else, but not much faster. Whereas the um, cognitive processor is a closed loop where I'm looking at it, my perceptual processor says, uh oh, we're in trouble. We need to extend the length of our strokes. It tells the, um, the, the cognitive processor determines that due to the rule it has stored. And it tells the motor processor, you got to go a little longer or shorter, depending on the direction. And that's then adding up all these three cycle times as an average number for each correction. So this answers the question. If a light turns on and you are supposed to press a button in reaction to that light, how long is that going to take? Well, these numbers and the model is based on lots of psychological experimental results, right? Um, and we've just confirmed it in a way for our own, with our own little experiment. Um, this should take 240 milliseconds on average for, you know, that middleman person that the uh, original authors mentioned. So this is not telling you how long it takes to get to that button if your hands are, let's say, on the mouse and you're supposed to press a button on the keyboard in reaction. It just tells you if your finger's already on the button, like with this little bubbly head guy here, how long will it take you to actually do that button press and react? The second question is actually super interesting. And we're just going to get started on that today, and I'll continue discussion of that uh, next time. The second question is answered in Fitt's law. How long does it take to actually reach a target based on the distance to that target and the size of that target? For that, you got to do one more experiment. Um, Jan? Yes. Um, we are already at uh, 12.22. Shall we do this in the lab instead? I don't think that the time will be enough. Um, OK, so I could skip the experiment. You do this in the lab, and but then we, we would discuss the theory behind it, you mean? Um, if you think the time is enough for that, we can do yeah, this. No, you're right. Yeah, let's do it, let's do it that way. Um, so you, you'll do the actual experiment in class. It's a fun experiment. You'll be lot, doing lots of tapping and breaking pencils and so on. Um, and I'll show you what the uh, findings show mean, but you'll confirm it in the lab just to see that it's true. Fitz law is really important, so it's perfectly fine to uh, to touch on this twice. Um, when you do this experiment, you're going to be tapping from the left to the right side of this bar, right, as fast as you can. And this will become slower as these targets be move farther out uh, apart from each other, but it will also become slower as the targets get narrower. And what we will find is that, and that's what Fitz uh, determined in the 50s again, um, that doubling the distance from four to eight centimeters for eight to 16 centimeters very roughly adds a constant to the execution time. So it doesn't take you twice as long to move from four to, uh, from, from, uh, to 16 centimeters as it does to move to eight centimeters and twice as long as it does to four. No, it actually increases only by a constant. And that should make all of you curious because that is weird. That's probably not what you expected. What that shows is that there is a logarithmic nature at work here, which is basically because when you try to acquire a target, you first make very big micro movements towards that target. And then you actually, your motor system slows down as you get near that target. That's why you can cover a large part quickly with your first movement and then smaller parts with your correction movements. And that's why it's a logarithmic law and not a linear law. The second thing you will find is if you double the target width, it gives you the same results as having the distance. In other words, if I take some uh, uh, the, uh, the design and photocopy it and make it two times as big, you know, I double the distance, but I also double the size of the target, it will not change the result. This indicates that the distance and the width are actually in relation to each other in the formula we're looking for. Because I want to know, based on the distance and the width, how long will it take a person to tap a, a, a target? 
This is important if you have an interface with lots of buttons that people need to reach quickly, like in an emergency situation. How close do I need to move those buttons? How big do they need to be? And how long will it take the person to press that button if they need to do it quickly? So these two facts, that it's a logarithmic law and that D is related to W in, in some kind of fraction in, a, in, a, in relation to each other, um, lead to Fitts law. What you find is basically a, um, <coughs> a slope. This, this is an interesting plot because it actually plots the time that people take to acquire a target on the y-axis, as you would expect. But it doesn't plot just distance or just width. It plots the relation from distance to width on the x-axis. And it actually doesn't plot the relation. It plots the logarithm of that relation. And when you do that, you actually get a linear relationship. So that shows us that the time to acquire a target is actually related to the log of the, dis the distance in relation to the width. Now there are factors in here, the 2D divided by W, uh, and that is a factor that you determine through the experiment that you find. It's not just D divided by W, for example. Um, and there will also be uh, a question of what's the slope of this line. And the slope of this line is actually what uh, Fitz called the index of movement. This basically tells you how tricky, uh, how, how good the apparatus is that you're using. Normally, we use our finger to acquire a button with Fitz law experiments. And then your apparatus is your natural human, um, you know, human movement apparatus. And for that, we know that this apparatus has a certain constant, uh, which defines the slope of this line, which is roughly at 100 milliseconds per bit. For other devices like the mouse or, or let's say, um, you know, maybe uh, an, an actuator in virtual reality, these numbers will change. Also, this index down here, this logarithm of the distance divided by the width is actually called the index of difficulty. Why? Because since it has both the distance and the width in there, it describes how difficult the task was. If that number goes up because the distance gets larger or the width gets smaller, then the difficulty of the task goes up. Assuming the same motor system, right? Because the motor system is modeled through the IM. And Fitts law is essentially just saying that this target time is IM multiplied by ID. So the index of movement basically times the index of difficulty. I have to say something about the target width here because you may wonder, how do I measure, measure target width? In this case, coming from point one to hit this target here, if it's a long uh, button and I'm coming from here, the target width would be this, the red line. If I come from point two, the target width is only this, this line, much smaller. And if I come from number three, the target width is actually the length of this diagonal intersection of the target. Why? Because in follow-up studies, Mackenzie and Buxton found that the target width has a much higher impact in the line of movement than it does sideways. I can explain this in, in, in natural terms. You actually have no trouble hitting a target um, in the general direction, like keeping the direction towards the target is easy. You're not going to veer off to the side hitting the target. But it's really hard to stop at the right moment approaching the target and navigate that distance to the target. And so the dis in, the, in that direction, in the distance to the target direction, that is where the target width is most uh, important to determine um, the actual effect. So these are all three different measures that you would have to do based on where you're coming from uh, to approach that target. Now, you might say, why is this important? And by the way, Oli, we should fix up the slides so that at least we see the, the actual formula of Fitz law here at least once, right? It's not appearing in the beginning here. Um, but why is this important? Well, this is important because if you look at a user interface, let's take, for example, this interface here. Windows 10 does this. It has a menu bar up here, right? Datei, Computer, Ansicht, Verwalten. To hit these buttons means that I actually need to acquire this button and I need to hit it along a very narrow height. If I shoot across this button and go too far, I need to navigate back. And if you measure the time people it takes people to hit a button in this menu, it actually is 
according to Fitz's law, what it is. It's fairly long, but you can do a trick. And Mac OS did this. It moved the menu to the top of the menu bar here, top of the screen. What happens with that change is that you actually end up um, increasing the size of the target area because no matter how fast I go up there to that top of the screen, my mouse pointer will always stop at the edge of the screen, doesn't go beyond, unless I have a weird multiple monitor setup. And because it stops there, this target is basically infinite width because I can go there slowly and just reach it, or I can go there super fast and my mouse pointer will end up on the top of that, uh, that edge here. Uh, and I can then click immediately. And that's why if you run an experiment, you will find that people are much faster clicking um, a target that is right on the edge of the screen, like this menu bar here in Mac OS, then they are clicking a target that's in the middle of the screen, like the menu bars in Windows, or even these toolbar buttons here in Mac OS. These are much harder and slower to acquire. The worst thing you can do, by the way, is leave a one pixel gap behind this menu bar, like above this menu bar, because then when I throw my mouse pointer up there, it'll end up in that one pixel gap and then I need to navigate back. So never do that. Never put icons at one pixel distance or a few pixels distance from the edge. Put them right onto the edge so I can use the screen that stops the mouse cursor to acquire these targets really, really fast. Now, just to wrap this up, um, the original uh, Fitz law has been improved quite a bit. Uh, a few years later, somebody found that actually he gets a better curve fit to experimental results if he, instead of using 2D divided by W in here in the brackets, he uses D divided by W plus one half. And that was improved even more. Uh, more experiments showed uh, with people that you get an even better curve fit if you use D divided, D divided by W plus one in the bracket. And um, this was also generalized by not just having this IM factor here, uh, which is based on, on the input device you're using or your finger as an input device, um, but also adding an absolute constant here, an absolute term in the, in the equation, because that in the end led to a better curve fit. A and B depend on the device and are determined experimentally. But if you need to do a quick and dirty estimate, you can use the numbers that we found that are roughly true for, for you know, raw finger as, uh, action, where you have A equals zero milliseconds and IM equals 100 milliseconds per bit. This doesn't just give you a better curve fit. It also fixes a little glitch in Fitz's law in the original formulation, where for certain values for D and W, you would actually end up getting negative times. This happens when you're already in the target area uh, in Fitz's law. When D is actually, uh, you know, uh, 2D is smaller than W, then you get weird results. OK. Um, this is basically, you know, the original Fitz's law is, would be this uh, formula, formula here beneath the graph. And that gets you into trouble because the log becomes diff, uh, turns, diff, uh, turns negative for D smaller than W half. So we don't, we don't want that part. And this is the improvement um, that uh, Welford did. Um, and here's the final uh, fix that also made it into the ISO standard for Fitz's law. Now, we do have an exercise for this, which we'll also postpone to the lab, because we just took a little longer today in, the, in this online format to get through our stuff. Uh, so I'll leave that exercise where you can try out Fitz's law and actually compute how long somebody will take to press a certain button. Um, and that will be happening at the lab. Let me summarize for today so we don't go too much over time. Um, we hope that you saw we do cool stuff. We also hope that you saw that HCI is about humans. It's about computers. It's about the design process to drive at an interface and about its social context. Remember that uh, overview graph. And then we saw two models. We saw the CMN model, uh, which lets you est actually estimate reaction times and memory performance of people without having to build a system. That's the cool thing, right? You don't need to run a study with a prototype to know this. You can use the model to calculate some first numbers and to maybe just make a design decision which um, system according to the model would perform better without having to test them. And then we looked at Fitz's law, which told you how to can calculate the average movement time of acquiring a target, as we say, basically you know, pushing a button or clicking a button, whatever input device you're using, 
uh, based on the distance and width of that target. Fitz law will come back to haunt you no end. It's a super important law for all kinds of manual input on interfaces. We'll talk a lot about it and we'll come back again and again. Um, and what I hope you're taking away from this first class is also that you've already seen that there seem to be mathematical laws that are governing some very fundamental aspects of our human perception, memory, and movement. So that weird bag of water I was talking about, that human that is so impossible to, do, to predict what they're going to be doing, well, it turns out at a very basic level, we can actually do some predictions and we can actually use math and engineering models to build good user interfaces because we can kind of estimate how users will perform on these very fundamental levels of interaction. What do you need to do now? Sign up for the course if you haven't already on RWDH online. Hand in your signed declaration of compliance. Uh, send it to Oli or Marcel with this naming scheme, uh, naming scheme, DIS1 in brackets, and then DOC, and then your last name and first name. Um, name the final name accordingly, please. You're just making uh, people's life much easier here. Remember, they have to go through like 300 of these. You don't need to send it again if you already did. Um, you can also check out other classes, of course, from the com computer science curriculum this week. You should be. And if you're not taking DS1, uh, please deregister so that we get a clean database of actual users um, as quickly as possible. Because we need to form groups for assignments, et cetera, and this all needs to happen very, very soon. So we don't want too many uh, you know, dead bodies in our, in our list of, of students. Before the next lab on Monday, uh, go out and buy Norman's book, right? The Design of Everyday Things. Uh, you might actually be able to get it at the Maya show if you want a really quick turnaround time, um, or you go you know, get it on your usual online platforms, um, ebook or, or, or paper book. Um, no matter what you go for, uh, you should be messing that book up. You should be making your own notes. You will make it your own copy. It should look like you actually went through it, make margin notes, highlight stuff in there as you read, practice active reading which I'm sure you've, uh, you've heard about before. Before next Wednesday, before the next class, you should read the first chapter, uh, an excerpt from the first chapter here, The Human uh, from Alan Dix's book, uh, Human Computer Interaction. We'll make the PDF available on Automation Moodle, and this will give you a little bit more backup on the stuff that we talked about today. Starting next week, we will dive heavily into Don Norman's book, so you should have it ready for then. Well. Um, with that, I'm all done. Thanks everybody for listening in uh, and being part of this class. Oli, any uh, last minute things I forgot? No, nope. you said okay. everything. Wonderful. Then thanks everybody for joining us and uh, have a great start into the semester. And we hope to see you all back again next week. Bye. Bye. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.